Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. We have any questions uh, from last week's stuff or from our reading or if you want the uh, the uh, lotto numbers, <laughs> whatever you would like. Are they guaranteed to win? I only want the winning numbers. <laughs> There's numbers. 319 million in the one in Arkansas. Ooh. They're guaranteed to win, provided you have enough time to wait. Because it's a matter of odds. Three hundred and nineteen million. Can you imagine that? Nope. I shall never. I shall never win. I keep telling the good Lord, I only need one that can take care of five families. With one million, I can take care of five families, and we'll be just fine. <laughs> I've never played. I shall never win. It's not true. There's always other ways to get a million. Somebody could gift you a million. Somebody You could find a million on the side of the road. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get a million dollars. You could find, sure. a, you could find a lottery ticket on the sidewalk. Exactly. I suppose. You could get one for Christmas. Our, my boss gave us all a scratch off for Christmas. <laughs> Did you win mm -hmm. anything? A dollar. <laughs> Oh well. You know, winning the lottery has never been high on my on my bucket list. <laughs> so is Sybil there? We don't have a video on her and you're muted, Sybil, if you are with us. So well, she disconnected. She's with us. Okay. I didn't oh. know I was unmuted. There you go. There. Hi Sybil. I, yeah. I I can see you. Okay, we can see we can't see you, but that's okay. That okay. I cannot allow my picture to be shown. I do not take. <laughs> I do not take pictures, not even with my grandkids. Therefore, I have hardly any pictures of change. We do not take pictures of ourselves. Okay. Okay. I know I'm weird. <laughs> These are live. These aren't pictures. This yeah. is live. <laughs> Zeb, well, you're talking about weird, and I'm sitting here. <laughs> True that. You have nothing weird on me. <laughs> Ask all the rest of these people. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, any questions? No? Yes? Going once? Going twice? Okay, we're moving on to Ezekiel chapter 14. Yeah, try it again. I had a question. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, on our podcast, I think it was today, I don't know, she was talking about when Jesus was on the cross and he said, why have you forsaken me or something to that effect, that her viewpoint of what happened is different than what most people are. It was something about that most people think with it. He was separated because he had sin and God can't be associated with sin and then she had a different view. You remember hearing that? Yeah, that was this morning. Uh, maybe you could expand on that because I kind of understood it, but I didn't completely understand it. Well, it's... She was she was talking on a line that I, that I've talked about a little in the past. Um, first of all, when when Jesus said uh, Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani on the uh, on the cross, which is Aramaic for My God, My God, Why have you forsaken me? Quoting yeah. uh, David from one of the Psalms, one hundred one or one hundred two, I forget. Um, twenty two was what we read today. Oh, twenty two. Okay, I had one of the numbers right. I get half credit. Um, he was he was quoting that psalm. A lot of people think, 
Who is he? And she is of the opinion that rather than quoting the psalm, Jesus was quoting the initial, the opening uh, phrase of the psalm so that everybody else would know what psalm he's talking about, which is a messianic reference psalm. Um, I think both can be true at the same time, that uh, God was, was rejecting Jesus in as much as, as a member of the triune Godhead can reject part of himself. So uh, I, I have, I've talked about, about this on, in the past, about it can't be a total fracture in the Godhead, because then Jesus would not be God, and that can't happen. So it was. It can't be a. It it can't be that he was totally rejected and no longer part of the Godhead. So we we, we have to figure out what was Jesus saying when he said, "Why have you forsaken me?" And in what way does that apply to him as a co-equal member of the of the Triune Godhead? That's part of what I'm studying in uh, in my study on the conflict in God um, God in some fashion rejected Jesus had to or there would be no payment for for sin uh, how that plays within the triune Godhead is still kind of a, a mystery I'm I'm reading a book right now from from a, a German theologian um, who is who studied at at Turbigen, which is uh, one of the or I think that's how you pronounce it, one of the most liberal theological centers in the world. Um, but he he wrote a book on uh, when God was crucified, and what does that mean? And I'm trying to I'm trying to get an understanding of really what happened to Jesus when he became sin for us. What exactly does that mean? And that's the difficult part. Um, I think it means more than we typically think it does, but I don't know that we know what it means. Could God have been uh, rejecting the humanness of Jesus at that point? Well, a lot of people look at it that way, but I don't know that they, I don't know that they can be separated. Okay. Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, and I don't know that that can be separated. So I, I don't know. It's it's part of what I'm trying to figure out, um, and I'm doing a lot of reading on this, and and I've read a lot of. I bet I've read thirty theological journal articles in the last couple of weeks, trying to get a handle on what guys think out there, and I I'm just not certain. the The problem is, what does what does Jesus mean when you reject me? Why have you rejected me, or forsaken me? Um, so, so uh, Tara Lee Cobble's answer this morning is satisfying in one way that he was not really saying that God rejected him. He was calling everyone's attention to the song. She's partly correct that that's a, that's a well-known way of, um, of calling attention to a psalm or a passage by reading the first phrase of the passage. But I'm not certain that that fully applies in this situation. So, Thank you. I, I, I'm afraid I didn't answer the question very well, but I don't think there's really an answer yet, at least not one that I have. I, I haven't yet, I don't understand yet what happened to Jesus on the cross. And I suspect most scholars pastors, preachers, Bible students, I don't think most understand yet what happened to Jesus on the cross. And it may end up being that this is a true antinomy, two things that seem to be mutually exclusive, but both are true. And if that's true, we'll go to our graves or we'll go to heaven not knowing an answer to that. And I hope er, lear learning an answer by the time uh, by some time in, in eternity. In her book, she says, um, yes, drawing attention to that psalm, that's like saying, open your hymn book to page 23, and we're going to sing right. the song. 
that um, she says when Jesus was on the cross quoting the first line of the psalm, it's almost as if he was saying, remember that psalm about the coming Messiah? That prophecy David wrote, it's about me. This is right. it. I'm it. Right. Right. And, and that's, a, that's, that's certainly understandable and uh, has a lot of, of potential to it. And it makes it easier to accept what Jesus says on the cross. But it doesn't make it simpler to understand what happened to, God, to Jesus on the cross. <laughs> so it fills one, it, it, it makes one side of me feel better, and the other side of me goes, but wait. <coughs> so I don't, I don't have a great answer. And this has become my, my uh, favorite study, trying to figure out what happened to Jesus on the cross and, and how does this conflict actually occur. Are you tacking on to that? What happened to Jesus in in the time he was in the grave? Yeah, that's all part of it. <clears throat> the conflict of God in God, or the conflict in God, has to include his his holiness and righteousness and justice, and his grace and mercy, and then how that gets played out in the sacrifice of of himself, his son one of the members of the triune Godhead on the cross becoming sin for us. You know, as Tara Lee pointed out this morning, Habakkuk says, you know, God can't look on sin. That's a true statement. But not the way we anthropomorphize it, looking at it through our eyes. Not being able to look on sin means we, we completely can't look at sin. But that's not what God is because... God is omniscient. He can't. He can't help but look at it. He can't help but know it. He can't forget it. On that note, I went back and listened to Randy's uh, talking about baptism later on Sunday because the voice goes louder and softer to the point that I can't understand them on, when I'm listening on Sunday. Yeah, we had we had some <laughs> terrible audio problems Sunday. Yes. So, Randy kept calling the Godhead one God, three personalities. And that just struck a little bit of a with me. Is Randy not saying that God is not three persons and rather just one God with three personalities like a schizophrenic? No, I, I, think, I think he was using the words in error. I don't think he believes that at all. Uh, he, he corrected himself a couple of times where he said one God in essence but three persons. But then he, he also said it other ways. And, he used uh, personalities quite a few times. He did. But, but he said it properly also. Um, and so I think, he's, I think he's making it easy, that's all. One God in essence in being and three persons. Um... The more I study the Trinity, the more I'm, I'm convinced we do it in justice the way we understand it. I can't understand it. I just have to accept it because it... I mean, how can you accept one, one God that's three people? That just is not, well, well three beings. It, he's not saying three beings. He's saying one being, three persons. And, and he was using person and personality interchangeably. Well, there's the person of the God. Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit, but one God. So not three beings? Not three separate entities? No, that no. Are all They're all one being, three persons. How can you be a person if you're not a separate being? Well, you can't be a separate <laughs> being and being one God. So my original understanding was correct. I don't know. I don't know well, what the original. I'm, I don't know what the original understanding was. <laughs> well, my original understanding was basically one being, three personalities. Personality is probably the wrong word to use. Persons is a better word to use. But, but when we say person, we think of a being. Yeah, that's so part I, of the problem me. with understanding the Trinity. Yeah. 
we anthropomorphize everything and we I can't ever say it right <laughs> anthro pathetic pathetic eyes it we make God have have characteristics of us and we make God have emotions like us because that's all the, the only way we can describe God is what we know and we only know us and so hey. it, it, it is a problem and you're not the first to struggle with it and you won't be the last yes if you really want to delve into the into an understanding of the Trinity get uh, Nebel Qureshi's uh, Seeking uh, Seeking Allah Finding, finding Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. Say it again yeah. Seeking Allah Finding Jesus Okay Nebel Qureshi I, is was he's now deceased a uh, a Muslim a devout Muslim and he wanted to understand better and in medical school in a chemistry class he was introduced to and help me out what is it was he was introduced to a a uh, uh, sorry I can't remember what the word is. Anyway, he was introduced to, to something that could be in three states in the same place at the same time. It's not possible except in this one thing. And when he was introduced to that, that allowed him to see that the Trinity is something that's possible in in the universe. And so... It was nitrate or something like nitrite. that. Nitrite. That, that's right. Nitrite. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Um, he, he was able to see that it can be three different things at the same time at the same place and so in doing that he uh he was able to see that that the trinity is actually something that can be real within uh within the universe and so he was he was then open to the gospel and he became a christian and he became a uh a uh an apologist and uh until he died of stomach cancer I don't know, four years ago or something like that. But in his book, he talks about his quest to to seek Allah, and he ends up finding Jesus in the course, and he describes that. And he has he has a fairly long section where he talks about um, that day in the chemistry class and what that means. Yeah, I wrote it down. Thank you. Yep. That is. Uh, may, go, may, go may I share how James explain, explained the Trinity? Sure, go ahead. He says, I'm James Olin Felton Jr. This is like God, and he didn't say he was God. He says, I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm a husband. I have different jobs. I, I have di different things to do as a son, as a father, and as a husband, all, all three people, my father can look at me, my daughter can look at me, my wife can look at me, and they only see James. And yet, in my relationship to them, I have different jobs to do, or however he, he, he said that. And, and that's how he always would explain uh, to people about the Trinity, how there can be one God, yet three persons or three personalities just like he had different functions i don't know if you agree with that well it's it's a good analogy but it's not complete because it's not just different functions of the father son and holy spirit they're actually different people persons don't mm -hmm. want to don't want to humanize humanitize them but they're different persons but they're all co-equal they're all co-eternal they're all coexistent, yeah. um, but they are different, and yet they're all the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, explaining God with human terms is ridiculous, anyhow. I mean, exactly. It, yeah, it, it's it's next to impossible, and it is one of one the one body head. No, not even that. <laughs> it, if when. when when you're in seminary and you have to do a church history class, almost all of the church history class talks about the ways that throughout the last 2,000 years, 
the church has gotten the Trinity wrong and all of the false religious systems that have come out of that. It is a complex problem. And there is no good <laughs> interpretation of it. And, and that's what makes the nitrite that Neville was exposed to so intriguing. It's the only thing in nature that can be three states at once in the same place at the same time. You know, even water of solid gas and liquid, it can't be the same thing at, at the same place at the same time. It's one or the other. So it fails in that. But the picture of the nitrite can be three things at the same time in the same place. Uh, I don't understand it. I struggled through chemistry, and uh, and so I'm not going to pretend to understand it. I, I struggled through chemistry, too. I'm probably not going to understand it either. <laughs> but uh, but I even if you just book. do a Google search on uh, Nebel Qureshi um, Trinity Nitrite, you'll find all sorts of... You'll even find him explaining it on some videos. Oh, cool. Did you get that, Mary, when I showed I you? I did. Did you get his name? I still like Sybil's, I still like Sybil's uh, answer to that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good one. That's, person that's, that's, three different that's, jobs. that's how right. my husband would explain it. And let, yeah, and I like that uh, one. I can live with that one. <laughs> It's, 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 it's a finite answer to an infinite God. So yes, yeah, that's and that and that's really a real problem that we have. I'm I'm working on our Sunday school material for the for the attributes of God and the names and titles of God, and and I start with a whole section from uh, Lewis Berry Chafer where where we go through that where where you're talking about we 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 are limited in our ability to describe. A, an infinite God by using things that we understand and experience, our emotions, our being, and so forth. God is so much more than that, we can't, we can't put it into words other than our own experience, and that so limits him. It's very, very interesting. Navigators just came... Uh, through on Facebook and offered to people a free ebook on um, uh, on a thirty day devotional on the name and titles of God. <laughs> well, I'm wor I'm working diligently on uh, getting it done. I don't I won't have it near close to being done when I have to start teaching it. So I won't have handouts and stuff. So oh. we'll we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that. But it's like all of my studies. It's becoming more involved. We still learn. Yeah. Okay, so we're on to any other questions before I go? Okay, we're on to consulting a prophet, Ezekiel chapter 14. And we're going to pick up in chapter 14, verse 1. Okay. And certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. I, I love I love the way Ezekiel doesn't waste a lot of time setting the stage because he assumes you understand where he is and what's going on in the world. He doesn't he doesn't spend a lot of time. Where is he? He's in Babylon. He's by the Kabar Canal. He's in exile as Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians have taken the the uh, the Assyrians and that meant all of the uh, northern tribes and now Judah into captivity and all that's left is uh, Jerusalem standing and not for long. You can uh, see where he is if you go back to chapter three, verse twenty-five. But the Spirit entered me into and set, into me and set me on my feet. And he spoke with me and said to me, Go, shut yourself within your house. So there he is. He's in his house in Israel or in uh, Babylon. We can go through a whole bunch of stuff and see the time frame. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the leaders of Judah sitting before me, the hand of the Lord 
God fell upon me there. So he's confined in his house, and we have a precise date. So they were coming you, to today. The, I'm sorry? Where did you read all that about six months and all that? Um, chapter 8, verse 1, and before that, chapter 3, verse 24. Thank you. I'm going, I'm not planning this. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Okay, I found it here. Verse 2, And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set their stumbling, stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? So, the elders of Israel come to Ezekiel seeking a word from God. When God tells Israel, what God tells Israel is very clear. God tells, I'm sorry, what God tells Ezekiel is very clear. God tells Ezekiel that these men, the elders of Israel, have taken their idols into their heart and set a stumbling block of their iniquity before their fi their faces. The immediate con, you got, you got to figure out who these men are. I've already told you it's the, uh, it's the elders. The immediate context indicates these men is the elders of Israel. And I think these men is not just the immediate elders of Israel, but it includes the all of the leaders of Israel. Not just the exiled ones. There's still a few left in Jerusalem. God's bringing indictment against all of the Jewish leadership. You might even be able to argue that he's bringing an indictment against all of the leaders of Israel throughout Israel's history that have failed in leading Israel to God. There were very few that did it right, that led Israel toward God. There were a few, but not many. The leadership had failed to protect the people of Israel. They had failed to, to lead them the right way. They'd failed to protect them. And uh, the leadership, as we saw last week, was actually leading people away from God. Not even doing a poor job of leading them to God. They were leading them away from God. So God says that the idols that the leadership had set up became a real stumbling block for them. And the people just couldn't get past that, that kind of leadership. Worship of idols and false gods had created in Israel an extensive idolatry practice that including sacrificing children to these false gods. I don't understand the mentality of being able to sacrifice a kid. Um, I just, I, I don't, I don't know how that works. I cannot imagine a parent wanting to do that. Right. Makes no sense. It is no not, sense. it is not something readily seen in Western culture, but is more identifiable in Eastern cultures? Parents still do it in India. Yeah. They sacrifice their daughters to uh, the sex trade mm -hmm. because that gives them the money to care for who's left. But in a sense, if you view idolatry as anything that prevents us from, from following God, in Western cultures, we sacrifice our kids to idols, too. Yep. Because we involve them in everything that keeps them from seeing God. When Kate was really young and a really good swimmer, and, uh, and wanted, not that she's not a good swimmer now, but when she was really young, they wanted her to be on Swim Florida because she was faster than kids her age. But all their meets were on Sunday morning, and we said no. But many parents would have said, yeah, we'll do that. 
And I believe that's <laughs> sacrificing your child to an idol. Because for many people, sports is an idol. And I'm going to leave that there. Verse 4, Therefore speak to them, God speaking to, uh, to Ezekiel, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with a multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are all estranged from me through their idols. So Ezekiel is directed by God to respond to the elders. Thus says the Lord, If I were one of those elders, I would be on the edge of my seat and very afraid of what was coming. If I went before the Lord with ex expecting him to do for me after all of the idol worship, I would be very, very afraid. I would probably be in a panic. And I would be thinking, this is it. God's going to get me now. I would not go before the Lord. What's I that? I would be hiding. I would not go before the Lord. I'd be hiding. Well, they're, they're desperate. They have nothing left. Their idols have failed them. And so they're desperate. Think about the hypocrisy of these elders following idols and now coming to Ezekiel to receive direction from God. They had worshipped false gods, but now were coming to God so they could get something they wanted or actually needed. They had led people away from God, but now were turning to Him for direction. God says, well, I'm going to answer you. He'll answer those leaders who have followed other gods. He'll answer them in a desire to lay hold of their hearts of the house of Israel. God still would respond to him. For those of you that listen to the, pod, the, uh, the uh, Bible recap podcast every morning, that's a God shot right there. Mm -hmm. Despite all of their turning away from God, leading people away from God, I'm still going to respond. Now, they're probably not going to like it. They're probably not going to like how he's going to respond, but he's going to respond. And here's how he responds. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn away from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart, and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him myself. And I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword, and cut him off from the midst of my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks the word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet and will stretch out my hand against him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear their punishment. The punishment of the prophet and the punishment of the inquirers shall be alike. That the house of Israel may no more go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, declares the Lord God. Whew, gives me goosebumps. God told Ezekiel to, stay, to say to the house of Israel that he will respond to anyone who followed idols, but still comes to the prophet to hear from God. God says, I'll answer him myself by turning from him and make him an example and cut him off from the nation. Anybody that thinks they can worship false gods and yet in a time, uh, time of need cry out to the one true God will quickly discover that God will not permit that. God will not tolerate any Israelite that worships a false god but turns to the one true God in the time of need. Kind of like having your cake 
and eating it too. God will send that person to a premature death. Now, is God talking about here when he says that he will cut them off from his people, is he talking about that he will excommunicate them from Israel and from him and make them not saved or savable? Or is he talking only in a physical sense? He's certainly talking at least in the physical sense that he's going to remove them so that their influence is no longer there to the other people. Now, I don't know if it means that he's going to cut off, cut them off as in their, their, their lineage will also be cut off. Well, we know he can't be talking about that he would unsave them. They're not saved anyway. Well, they might be. They can be saved while they're worshiping idols? Well, they could have been saved before that. And use the improper term, but the, everybody understands what I mean, backslidden, and became mm -hmm. a follower of an idol. Mm -hmm. In Israel, that was relatively easy to do. Because they misunderstood where their salvation comes from. They thought their salvation came from the sacrifice of the lamb. You know, the Baba black sheep lamb, not the lamb on the cross. And so I would, I would venture to say the number of, of followers of God, true followers of God in Israel under the law was relatively small because the leadership taught them a system that wasn't true. And wasn't consistent with the Word of God. Yeah, I listened to Randy's uh, session on communion. I thought that was the best one I've ever heard. So, uh, we, we know that God doesn't change. And so, if salvation is always by faith, that if you're saved, you're always saved, that anybody saved in Israel because they actually trusted God, and then fell and became followers of, of idols, God couldn't unsave them. Now, did that happen much? Probably not. But I have no way to know. I think God is talking about here, He's just going to physically kill them. He's going to remove them from His people, and I think that means He's going to kill them. I don't think Isn't there a place in the New Testament where it says that if we consistently uh, choose to disobey after we believe that God will take us home? Well, that's a, that's a, that is a principle that we derive from the text. It doesn't specifically say that. I thought there was some place in the New Testament that said that. No, that's a, that's a principle that we derive from from the text that that God will will discipline us, and the ultimate discipline <laughs> correction is. He removes us. But there's there's not like a Paul 3 that says if you're bad long enough, you'll, God will kill you. I wish we had Paul but we don't. <laughs> so here, listen to uh, to what uh, one of the uh, uh, Old Testament scholars who, who specializes on uh, Ezekiel, uh, Dr. Ian uh, Duggid states, If the people refuse to listen to God's prophets, who tell them the truth, the Lord will bring judgment on the people by giving them lying prophets, who will tell them what they want to hear. God's action in giving the prophet a deceitful oracle is nothing other than giving him and hears what they have sought. Now, I just want you to be really careful how we interpret what Ezekiel is being told by God here. When, uh, where was it, in verse uh, 9, I think it was. Um, if, the prophets, if, the, <clears throat> if the prophet is deceived 
and speaks a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. That does not mean God is lying to him. Because God can't lie. So under, both, both the uh, uh, Old Testament scholar here and a, com, an, an, a normal reading of verse 9 kind of leads you to the conclusion God's lying to them. He's not lying to them. He's, he's, he's allowing them to do what the sinful man is bent to do and he's giving the people what they ask for. God's not telling him two and two is five. He can't. It's not possible for God to lie. I think Peter says that. So, just as you go through this passage and you read that, I, uh, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Understand, God is not lying. So, when, when it says that God has deceived the prophet, God has permitted the prophet to deceive. It's a, it's a, a difference in understanding of how the text flows together, I think. We kind of sort on. of like God didn't uh, didn't cause Job to lose everything. He allowed Satan to do it. Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Yeah. Uh, but God instigated this this stuff with Job. You know, He said to Satan, "Hey, you know my my guy Job. Yeah, Job. Satan says, yeah, Job just likes you because you give him everything. Well, do what you want. Don't kill him, but." You'll, I'll prove to you that that's not true. So, kind of, but... This is, this is, one, this is really difficult to, to grapple with. And I think that the way this, this scholar puts it makes it sound even more like God is actually lying. God can't lie. But, go ahead, Nancy. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah says, I will entice, emphasizing the certainty of the judgment in this case. The Lord used deception to judge a deceptive prophet. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah. It, it's saying the exact same thing. And, and it's, it's right there on the ragged edge of, of is God lying? It's like, God creating Adam with the potential for sin, knowing that he's going to sin. Did God cause Adam to sin? No. But God created the environment that sin was possible, knowing that God, that Adam's, Adam would want to sin and did sin. But God didn't cause him to sin. It's a very fine line of distinction. And can very easily be misunderstood and misapplied. Wouldn't it be something like he hardened their hearts? You know, talking about a lot of places in the Bible, it says right. he hardened their hearts. Right. And he deceived them. That's kind of along the same line. It yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, Jesus comes to Israel and offers the kingdom knowing that they can't accept it. But it's a, it's a full faith offer of the kingdom. Some See, would that say that's a deception. Say yeah. that again. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why did he offer it if he knew they weren't going to accept? Because he has to. Because they were the chosen people and he was the Messiah. And he had to set up the, the situation where the Messiah would be executed so that, that the penalty would ultimately be paid for. But he has to offer it. And if they rejected it, where would we be? If, if they had accepted it, where would we be? Or accepted it. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Here, here's, here's what we're, we're coming face to face with frequently as we study Scripture deeper and deeper. Some of the things that get glossed over because they're difficult to understand, when you stop and have to look at them, it makes things very difficult. 
There's a reason that in most sermons and stuff, those things are glossed over. Because now you're on, you, when, when you read, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. You're, you're, you're confronted with an issue of how do I interpret that and God not be a liar. You know God can't be a liar, so there has to be a way to interpret it. And so you have to spend the brain power to figure out how does God, how does God say, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet without being a liar? By allowing them to be deceived and not correcting them. Correct. But in this case, that's an active verb. I have deceived them. Lord used deception to judge the mm -hmm. prophet. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't look. Is uh, does MacArthur make any comments on that? You got my brain broken again. Yes. Here I got Jeremiah here tonight. What verse was that, Nancy? Uh, chapter uh, fourteen, verse nine. Nine. Yeah. Nine through. Yeah. Here's what MacArthur says. Um, he says, He stretch out my hand. God will deceive a false prophet only in a qualified sense. When one willingly rejects his word, he places a resulting cloud of darkness or permits to continue hiding the truth so that the person is deceived by his own obstinate self will. Yeah, Dr. MacArthur is saying. Essentially what I said, he, he was allowing the deception to go ahead, the deception created by, by the false prophet. God didn't lead him in creating that false, prof, or false uh, prophecy. He just allowed him to continue with it. That's what I said. Right. I said you were right. <laughs> I just want you to understand that as we go through the text, and you're confronted by these things that that become more and more difficult because you're you're looking at them in a much deeper way than typically. And so if your brain doesn't hurt at least once a week from studying scripture, you ain't doing it right. My hurts every day. Go ahead, Linda. MacArthur continues, says, this fits with the same principle when God gives up Israel to evil statutes, counsel that they insist on as they spurn his word. When people refuse the truth, he lets them seek after their own inclinations and gives them over to the falsehood. The wrath of, abundant, the wrath of abundance is noted in Romans 1, 18 through 32. I was just going to say, that sounds like Romans 1. I'm sorry, yeah, of abandonment, not of abundance. Yeah. That sounds like Romans 1. I just got done teaching that. Deception <laughs> always... You can, you can go to... Uh, where did it go? Um, James 1.14. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Deception comes from our own heart. And forces God to take corrective and punitive actions. God's ultimate goal... I got the hiccup, sorry. Uh, God's ultimate goal in dealing harshly with the people of Israel was to bring about their return to him and return to the covenant relationship with him. God was, in effect, giving Israel what it wanted. It wanted to follow false gods and false teaching, and God said, fine, go ahead and do it. But just don't come to me and ask me to bail you out again. Um, verse 9 is not speaking of Ezekiel, but of false prophets that have been leading Israel and speaking as though they were coming from God. The message the false prophets would deliver would uh, be a deceptive message meant to give the people what they wanted to hear and not the truth. Punishment would first come and they could not seek direction from one of God's prophets to escape the punishment if they weren't going to turn back to God. God called on the people to repent over 
and over he did. But they didn't repent. God had promised them that they would be punished. That they'd be removed from the land if they continued to violate the covenant with him. Yet Israel always believed that God would not actually punish them. Israel went into captivity in 722 and Judah said, but we're the favorite, so it won't happen. Then Judah went into captivity beginning in 605 and by 586 everything had fallen. The end result of the punishment God was bringing to Israel would be their return to God and a return to the covenant relationship, which did not happen when they returned to Israel. As we, as we talked about the, the idolatry practices of, of pre-exile were replaced in the post-exile practices of the idolatry of the law. God always has restoration in his, in his mind. God never punishments, punishes for punishment's sake. Not until the last final judgment. God's looking for restoration. Restoration does not come for Israel until the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium. I believe that I can make a pretty convincing argument that the period of the Gentiles began in 722 when Assyria took the northern tribes and continued is continuing now and will continue until the end of the tribulation. So, would you consider the period of the Gentiles a dispensation, or would you could just consider that a time period that you mark on a timeline? I, I am not a hyper-dispensationalist, but I'm not a traditional dispensationalist either. I believe there are more than the seven standard dispensations, and I don't believe one has to end before the another one starts. And so the age of law continued, the age of Gentiles started in 722. Age of law continues until, until Pentecost. The, the age of grace start, started, I believe, at the cross. Not at Pentecost, but at the cross. And continues then until the tribulation. I should say until the rapture, in case there is a time period in between. And uh, the, the only... Two dispensations that I would argue are defined in Scripture as a time period are the tribulation and the millennium. <laughs> All the others are a little more fluid. Certainly the ones that we're in. We're in two dispensations right now, I believe. That is the, the dispensation of the Gentile, the time of the Gentiles and the church. Now, most staunch dispensationalists would say I'm cuckoo because in order for dispensations to work, you have to stop one to start another. I don't believe that. I think they can overlap. I don't got a question on that, Rich, but... Go ahead. Well, I got a question. I got a... I'll, I'll, I'll roll through it, but, you know, the way that God deals... A dispensation is the way that God deals with... Um, with the earth at that point, with the people at that point, uh, would have God having a split personality or or two systems um, that are not necessarily compatible. Correct. Uh, he'd have two rule books going at the same time. To me, that sounds like that's going to violate the character of God. No, because because we we are, we see that in the New Testament in what we believe is the the church age. In how God did things in the book of Acts, I mean, we're in in uh, in Acts chapter eight. What what had to happen before the people in Samaria got the Holy Spirit? The disciples, the apostles, had to come. Right, and lay hands on. But if if the church age begins at Pentecost, and in the church age the Holy Spirit indwells you immediately upon salvation, then obviously something's a amiss. In Acts chapter eight, as a transitional. Wait, period. wait. How does transition work if one's got to stop and the other's got to start? 
as it happens together, your transition is together. What you make it sound like is there are two systems going at the same time, extended period. Well, they, there is, but one system one system ended in seven twenty two to 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 the cross. You have the ending of the of the age of law. The ending of the age of law is in progress. Because Israel was was never free after 722. They they had removed that system basically in 722 when they went into captivity. Mm -hmm. It still functioned, but didn't function right. And that and that is for for the Jews. Their system. And then, and then in 70 AD, you know, with 30, 40 years after the age, church age ended, the age of law comes to an end because the sacrificial system is completely over. So you've got all these overlaps. It depends on who you are, and it depends on, on where you are, on what dispensation... You're in. But again, those are, are short transitional periods of time as as God completes his work with one group and moves to another. And that's the biggest one I would see in terms of um, transition is, is law to church or law to grace, however you like want to term it, um, as opposed to some of the other the patriarchal and age of innocence; those came to a pretty much pretty abrupt end. Yeah, relatively. Really and, and I add the age of the Gentiles as a dispensation because of the effect that it has on Israel. Most dispensationalists wouldn't say the age of the Gentiles is a dispensation. Mm -hmm. But I think it certainly shows God dealing differently starting in 722. Who left? Sandy. Bye, Sandy. Uh, I, think, I think it shows God beginning the process of dealing differently with Israel when he takes the northern tribes into captivity and never really brings them back. And then he takes Judah into captivity. And then he takes uh, Jerusalem into captivity. And then he permits them to come back, but they're still not free. They have a... When they come back from, from uh, captivity, you know, they, they're controlled still by... First by Greece and then by Rome. And Rome ultimately controls the... Uh, the religious system, they appoint the high priest. And so they don't have a, a true sacrificial religious system happening. And so the age of Gentiles is, is continuing, begins in 722, phases in, ramps up, and will continue until, until Israel finally gets to the point in, uh, at the end of the tribulation where they recognize God and accept God and the new covenant is uh, is upon them, and we have the beginning of the millennial kingdom. The age of Gentiles is all about preparing Israel for uh, for the millennium, and most guys look at that only being the tribulation, and I think it extends all the way back to 722, because God started punishing them, them, and they don't they they haven't come out of that punishment yet. I didn't realize that the northern tribes never came back at all. Well, they, some did, but they you don't hear of them. You, they, they were called Israelites before the captivity. They're called Jews afterwards. Why? Judah. Jews is for Judean. Because that's the predominant tribe, and that's really the only people that come back. Most Jews today don't know what tribe they're from. And they don't have really a way to know. Except for Levites. Levites have some, some DNA peculiarities that they can be picked out. 
which I think is interesting, but most Jews don't know. Oh, in the world. world. <coughs> it's it's crazy. But Chuck, I admit, I'm I'm a relatively uh, small group of of people that would add the age of Gentiles as a dispensation. But I would just ask people to to define what a dispensation is, what what's God's purpose in having a dispensation, and then does the age of Gentiles meet that criteria? And if you say yes, then you have to admit that it overlaps and you can have more than one at a time. And and how long you can have a transition, I don't think there's anywhere that defines that. No, there wouldn't be anything defined in there. And our understanding of dispensations is is allowing us to see how God works in different time periods. And I'm just adding some periods to that. There are some hyper dispensationalists that have 27 or 29 dispensations. That's too many. I, and I can understand that more than an overlapping. Yeah, I understand. I want your brains to hurt. Mine hurts all the time, so I want your brain to start too. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.